we kind of talked about some of the intuition behind regularization. We've done a little, tiny bit of the mathematics behind it. And now I'd like to demonstrate using a fairly contrived uh, example, how each of these different learning algorithms uh, make choices about what the coefficient should be. So, so we're gonna set up this uh, very simple regression problem uh, by creating some fake data. Uh, and then we'll compare the ridge, the lasso, and the elastic net solutions. I've already set up a little bit of the code. Here are our inputs, our imports. So we have our linear regression, which is our LMS solution, ridge, lasso, and elastic net. We're also going to be generating some random data, random data so I've imported that. And then we've already talked about uh, setting up uh, figure default parameters. All right, so first off, what I'm gonna do is set up a regular sampling of uh, something we'll just call time. And then what we'll do is create an artificial output, which is just a simple function of that. So we're gonna take the cosine of uh, t, uh, time. So this is the target variable that we're actually going to be generating. And, and now the approach is let's create a set of input features that look kind of like this output prediction that we're supposed to be making, uh, but we're going to corrupt that in some way. And so the hope is then that our model that combines these various features together, because the features are somewhat independent of one another, they can hopefully do a reasonable job of estimating what Y should be. So first feature X1 is just the value that we're trying to predict. Uh, plus we'll add some random noise to that. So this rand n function, uh, this samples from a standard normal distribution and we're doing it uh, many times. So we're, at, so we're sampling from that random distribution, multiplying it by 0.1, adding it into the, uh, the y value here. For x2, we're going to do a similar uh, thing, except we're going to make the magnitude of the noise a lot higher. x3, we're going to make it completely random. X4, we're gonna make it a relative to uh, cosine, but we're gonna make it a cosine that's a higher frequency than the, uh, than the one for Y. So that really, sometimes it's helpful, but depending upon what the phase is, it can be helpful or, or very unhelpful in predicting what Y should be. So, so correlation wise, it, it does not correlate with Y. X5, we're gonna make it equal to X1. So, so X1 and X5 contain exactly the same amount of information with respect to predicting what Y should be. And we're going to create another one that adds a little bit more uh, noise. Uh, th this last one adds a little bit more noise on top of what X1 is, which is some noise added on to the real signal that we're supposed to be predicting. Okay, so execute that. And let's go ahead and draw some of these features. So there's our function that we've created. Actually made that a little bit too big of a figure. So let's cut that down a little bit here. Sorry about that. 14 by six instead. So that should make it a little bit easier to see. There we go. So this is what we would expect from a cosine function. Let me go ahead and show you what 
a couple of other features look like. So let's look at X1. We'll draw that in green. And you can see it's, it's sitting now on top of the red curve, but you can see also that it's bouncing up and down around where that red curve really is. So I'll comment that back out so we have a little bit more uh, room to add a few other plots here. So let's look at X2. That one blue. And in fact, let me change the ordering of these two curves so you can actually see the red uh, in there. So, so as you can tell, the, the blue curve is very noisy relative to the, uh, to the red curve. And in fact, now let's, we can bring the green curve back in and look at how that's overlaid. So, so here the, the green curve actually is a pretty good representation of what red really should be. Okay, so let's look at the shape of our data set here. Uh, X1 dot shape uh, gives us our, it's telling us that we have indeed a vector that's 10,000 long. And now I'm going to write a little bit of code that uh, reshapes these features and then puts them all together into uh, one matrix. So let's pause while I do that. So I, all I'm doing here is uh, taking these, these vectors and reshaping them into two dimensional matrices. It's true I, that there's only one, uh, one column, uh, but, uh, but, but we now have a two dimensional matrix and that allows us to concatenate all of these uh, together uh, into one large matrix here. And then likewise for the outs, uh, we're taking that Y variable and reshaping it down to a matrix as well. So let's look at the shape there and outs.shape. Okay, so, so INS is now six columns by 10,000. Uh, samples and outs is one column by 10,000 samples. Okay, let's go ahead and build our first model. First, I'm going to set that uh, parameter in, in the math that I did. It was lambda, uh, it is alpha in, in the actual implementation in scikit-learn. And that takes, the fitting process takes ins and outs. And now we can ask what the coefficients look like. So after we've actually executed the fit method there, we can actually look inside the object and look at the individual coefficients. And something that you, you can see is that uh, some of the coefficients actually are uh, quite uh, large. And in fact, if you stare at this, the, uh, these two coefficients here those correspond to x1 and, and x5, and they're opposite sign. Let's look back at how we generate the data here. You'll notice that x1 and x5 are uh, identical in, in terms of how we actually generate the data. So in some sense, you can think of these two coefficients canceling each other out, but the magnitude of the coefficients is actually quite uh, disturbing here. And if X1 and X5 actually uh, in a future sample were not exactly correlated with one another, correlated being equal to one another in this case, then they would not balance precisely and, and we would end up with a very large magnitude answer. So let's ask the question of uh, what happens as we change this alpha parameter here. Let me change, add just a tiny bit of regularization there. So I'm setting up to point one, creating a new model, and now we can look at uh, what those coefficients look like. And, and what you can see, even with this very tiny uh, alpha here, the magnitudes of the coefficients have actually changed quite a bit. Uh, we no, no longer have that, that e to the positive 11. 
if I increase this, these coefficients will, will change a little bit. They're going to go down in magnitude some. Uh, and as this starts to get a lot bigger, the, the magnitude will, will start to get uh, smaller for all of the coefficients. So there's 10,000 right there. And, then, and at this point, they're getting quite small, uh, especially the ones that are not particularly useful. This is uh, X3. Let's look back at how X3 was generated. So X3, uh, in fact, is actually completely random. It's independent of what Y is. So, that, so that's one of the other interesting things about ridge regression is that even if the distribution says that an input parameter and a, a predicted variable are independent of one another, ridge regression is still happy to attach some coefficient to it that's not zero. Granted, it's relatively small, um, but when we were back at, say, an alpha of 0.1, it's actually uh, allowing a fairly reasonable magnitude coefficient there. Let's look at what predictions Ridge is actually making, given this training data. OK, so here's, here's the code to look at those two. Uh, curves are prediction versus uh, true. And, and uh, the prediction still is uh, noisy, but it is definitely capturing the, the trends in, in the data. Um, what happens if we uh, set this up larger? Let's go up to 10,000 just for fun there. And look at what we end up predicting. So you notice we still have some noise in the predictions that, that we're making, but we're actually now undershooting what the true signal is. So, so as this regularization parameter gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the algorithm actually wants to make flatter and flatter functions. So you're going to tend to see more of this overshoot uh, kinds of things happen. OK, so let's go ahead and create a, a lasso network. And this has its own uh, alpha parameter, regularization parameter. Uh, it turns out it wants really small parameters. So I'm going to select a 10 to the minus uh, a 3. So there we go. Created our lasso model. And uh, let's look at the coefficients. So there you go. So, so let's actually compare our coefficients for the ridge regression. Those don't line up exactly. But uh, what's interesting about lasso is that it set all of the coefficients to 0 except for the first two, the x1 and x2. And if you recall, these correspond to adding a little bit of noise to the true signal and then adding another order of magnitude of noise to the true signal. The, the others, in, in fact, x5, so it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. x5 is equal exactly to x1. And Lasso is quite happy to set that parameter uh, to 0. And, and, uh, and, and this is actually something that Lasso will do. Sometimes it will, in, in this particular case, with, where x1 and x5 are perfectly correlated with one another, they have the same information content, uh, Lasso will sometimes uh, assign the coefficients in this way, and other times we'll set coefficients for x1 to 0 and the coefficient for uh, x5 to something around 0.966. OK, but the, the key here is that Lasso has set a whole bunch of the parameters to 0. We can look at the predictions that Lasso produces. In reality, we're not going to end up with a very big difference here. And let's generate a plot. 
and there we go. And 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 this this particular example is rather contrived, uh, and I don't really expect us to be able to um, make predictions that are all that different than uh, than what we were able to do with the ridge regression model. Okay, so finally, let's look at elastic net. And this takes two parameters. So we have our lasso uh, type parameter alpha, our regularization parameter uh, alpha, and then we also have this uh, this balance in the math that I wrote it was this R parameter uh, in the elastic net class. It's called L1 ratio. And this again falls between zero and one inclusive. I'm going to split the difference here. And let's now fit this model. And we can look at what the elastic coefficients are. Okay, so in this particular case, you'll notice that uh, the parameter, we, first off, we have more uh, non-zero values for, for coefficients. And furthermore, for the redundant features, so, so this is x1 and this is x5, we have the same magnitude answer. And, and this is probably the kind of answer that we really want. Be, because in the real world, sometimes even though you have two sensors that are very well correlated with one another, occasionally one of them will fail, and, and we'd still like the, the network to be able to produce nominally some uh, sort of a reasonable answer. What LASSO will do is it will make an absolute decision as to which of those two sensors to uh, listen to, and if that one happens to fail, then all bets are off. As we change this L1 ratio, let's uh, try putting it to 0.1 and see what happens to our coefficients. So now you'll notice that we have one term that's probably right at zero, or maybe it's just arbitrarily close to zero. Uh, but the key here is that uh, we now have more coefficients that, that are non-zero uh, as compared to what we had with an L1 ratio of 0.5. So, so with a really small L1 ratio, we're actually uh, closer to our ridge regression type of solution. And as we make, we swing to the other direction, um, we actually end up with the same type of an answer as we did with, uh, with a 0.5. Let's see where that line is here. It's now to the point where it's uh, complaining a lot, um, but we're st it's still working really hard uh, to uh, assign uh, assign uh, four coefficients to something that's, that's non-zero. Uh, but in general, as L1 ratio approaches one, we're going to tend to see more zeros than the coefficients. Okay, so this is a, a quick demo of several different regularization procedures, and hopefully you're coming away with a, uh, at least an intuition as to how each of the three procedures works. And, uh, and, and uh, depending upon what you're trying to accomplish with, with a model, whether you want a very sparse model or whether you want uh, one with a lot of non-zero coefficients, uh, you, you might choose one or the other of these approaches, or you might choose that elastic net that allows you to kind of walk that line between uh, ridge regression and, and lasso regression. Next up, let's uh, try an experiment or two with, uh, with our brain machine interface data and see how well we do.